Hi, and I want to say welcome. This is uh, one of these breaks we're taking on Isaiah. Uh, Pastor Jeff today is, is receiving encouragement from uh, Pastor Marty Berglund. He does this once a month. Uh, and so this became a great opportunity because Jeff is so excited about Isaiah 53. That <laughs> <laughs> we all are. Well, we all are. But uh, it worked out well because he's not here today. Uh, that instead of my forging ahead and teaching Isaiah 53 when he's not here, is to take a break and do one of these extra classes, uh, perhaps we're calling them university classes. But the one I'd like us to, to look at today, if we finish it today, that would be great. If not, we'll finish it next week, uh, is the topic of spiritual gifts. Give me a definition, a description of spiritual gifts. I could guess. <laughs> so that's fine. Because um, other than the reading scripture, that any... God has given us to serve Him and spread His word and take care of other Christians and to evangelize to people who aren't Christians. Well, that's 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 that is an that amazingly <laughs> complete, complete answer. Uh, we are going to do a couple of things today. We're going to look scripturally what what spiritual gifts entail uh, and look at it from various different aspects. But then we're also going to acknowledge the fact that the Spirit gifts every believer gifts. with the same gifts. We all have the same gifts in common. These are the common gifts. And we're going to look at that because they, they are gifts, but then there are these unique gifts, these, these extra gifts that he gives. There are four main passages that list them, and so one of the pages you have here is, a, uh, uh, is an application of the four passages and the variations of unique gifts and where they show up. It's, it's a nice handy reference. Uh, we can talk about that. And then there comes this really difficult question of, called cessation versus continuation. And, and that has unfortunately created rifts among believers. Uh, my intent is to show you, I believe, scripturally what it has to say without giving you my answer because <laughs> I want the Holy Spirit to convict you how you stand on something like that. And finally, how do you know what it is that the Holy Spirit has given to you in the way of spiritual gifts? I get that question somewhat frequently, so we're going to get into that. The idea is to see scripturally what, is this, what does this all mean, and so I'm going to open us with a word of prayer. Dear Father God, I pray and I thank you that, that we can spend this time looking into your word, seeking you, knowing that you have equipped us with gifts that we might know, that we might, even as Barb said, that we might have these gifts for the betterment of, of each other and for reaching out to a lost world. Now we pray, Lord, that you would speak through me and that you would touch our hearts, that we would not just have information, but we would be motivated uh, into using these gifts according to your will. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. We are going to be reading a lot of scriptures today. Uh, so I'll be, I'll be passing them out as we go. But I want to start out with 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Chris, I would like you to have that, please. And uh, I am, I don't have some of Jeff's talents. He doesn't yes. have some of yours. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't found that yet, but. Um, <laughs> he can't referee. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably true. He could if he wanted, but he hasn't <laughs> found the calling yeah. to it yet. If I forget names, be, be kind to me. <laughs> Carol. Carol, yeah. You're going to get 1 Corinthians 7. You're okay. going to see them as they work down this for Romans 12, Barb. And Bob, you're going to get 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, and we'll stop there for now, and I'll, I'll add some more as we go. 1 Corinthians 12, 1. Chris, if you would have that, please. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, 
however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. The, why do we even spend our time? Why are we even taking a break from an amazing uh, passage like Isaiah to, to study this? Well, it says, quite frankly, I don't want you to be ignorant about these things. Mm -hmm. And to, to be in a relationship with God, to be a child of God, and to spend time in the scriptures, to come on Sunday to hear pastor preach, maybe to go to a small group, maybe even to be discipling somebody else, uh, or, or to hear, hear, hear people who are gifted, like, like, like Ian, uh, Ivan, who is so, so gifted in teaching, all of this, the women who are teaching, this is all good stuff. But the real message of what we're gonna get into today is that everybody in this room has gifts. And everybody has a gift for a reason. And it's God's choice. Now, in reality, as I'll get into it, as I already mentioned, we all have a big pocket full of gifts. And we all have the same big pocket full of gifts. These are things we get when, when we accept Christ. But then beyond that, God, he has unique uh, endowments of, of, of gifts. And there is a reason. And he doesn't want us to, to ignore the fact that we have gifts or to choose not to step out and use those gifts or to see somebody else that has a gift and to encourage them that they might use the gift. This, this is what makes the body, body whole and complete. A definition of spiritual gift. Barb's already taught this section, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> 1 Corinthians 7, 7, please. Um, I wish everyone could get along without marrying, just as I did. But we are not all the same. God gives some the gift of marriage, and to others he gives the gift of singleness. Now, this is taken into context, I, I get, of celibacy versus marriage and everything else. But the reality is God, for each individual, by his sovereign design, has, has said Rich, you're going to have the gift of wisdom. I mean, dude, you are able to hear a passage and know exactly what it is, all right? You have the gift of teaching, all right? Uh, the gift of service. Uh, could you come by on Monday and, and help the guys with the food? Absolutely, I'm going to do that. <laughs> Sweep the floor. <laughs> you know, we, we, we do. Uh, Romans 12, 6. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in portion to his faith. The, Can we continue? That's, that's enough. What we have are gifts chosen by God according to his will, strengthened and made sure by the grace of God. And, and so the, the gift that you have is, is not, you're not, you're not required to be the person who makes that gift effective. It's God who does that. It, it's, it's His grace. 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Yeah. Um, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. When we have a gift, there are no gifts that are better than others. There are no gifts that are more significant or you haven't been down graded by God saying, well, I can only give this person this gift because that's really all I can handle. No, every gift has, has its, its purpose and, and it's according to his will and it's, it's empowered by his grace and every gift has its place. We can read in 1 Corinthians 13 about, now we see through a mirror dimly, we can read about, you know, that we, the, when the perfect comes, we can read about these things. The gifts that we do have, as much as they are gifts given by God, and as much as they are powered by His grace, according to His will, they are only a shadow of things to come. So, if, if for instance, you have a gift and you feel like you're just awkward with it, that, that's okay. That's okay. Because your gift is not... The only person who has these gifts of perfection is Jesus. And, you know, every Sunday school class, what's the answer? Jesus. Um, 
we, this is the shadow of things to come. But we're also told, if, if you go into Hebrews, we're talked about that there are things according to the pattern of what is in heaven. So having the ability to say that I have the gift of discernment, that, that's not me, but if I, if I said I have the gift of discernment and I use it properly, then I am actually showing the people that I'm ministering to or, or serving a glimpse of God. This is a pattern of, of what there is to come. I'm saying these things to encourage you to say, I really want to know what my gift is because what I've got is unique. And if I don't use my gift, then there's that void in, in, in the fellowship. So knowing that. The definition I had, which part you gave, is almost word for word. Uh, you can get this out of 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, 1 Peter. It's an ability that's given by the Holy Spirit for the ministry of the church. That's a very simple definition. It's an ability that's given by the Holy Spirit. It's for the ministry of the church. What it is not is, is an ability given by the Holy Spirit so that I can be really good. Build up. It is, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't belong in the definition anywhere. Now, I'm going to go in, in, in paragraph two because they're not necessarily called the gifts of the Spirit. I get that. But there are a whole lot of things that we receive uniquely as believers that are gifts because they are supernatural abilities that the rest of the world doesn't have. Okay? But then there is something else called the spiritual fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit and how does that differ from the gifts of the Spirit? Yeah. They're okay. attributes of Jesus that are developed in us as we grow to be like Him. That is amazing. You guys are you guys are really good today. <laughs> these are these are godly attributes <laughs> that that are that are grown in us through the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Love, joy, no, I'm, I'm going to quote it out of the NASB, an old version of it, so the words might be slightly different than yours. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not supposed to do this, Dr. Warren said, I'm never supposed to stop and look up, because I'm breaking eye contact. He also said that we're never supposed to say, um... And so sometimes instead of filling blank space, I, I choose to think for a second. <laughs> My wife can attest to the fact that when I don't think before I engage brain, it's bad. <laughs> That's the Apostle Peter's uh, affliction, affliction. Is that what it was? Yeah. He spoke before he thought. Yeah, he did. He did. Uh, <laughs> Pastor Warren had a, an amazing, great sense of humor. He kept us awake and alert and everything else. What's the only version you should preach out of, according to Dr. Warren? NASB. NASB. <laughs> it's a great Bible. He was having fun with guys who had the ESV. Yeah. That being said, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. It reads different in other translations. These are the godly attributes, as you said, that are given to us. We, as believers receive receive these and are able to develop these and apply these or not apply these in total and not in part. It's not like you get the first three, you get the second three, and, and you've got six of them, and I only get one. No, we, we've got them all. Those are spiritual fruit. And I do challenge you that at the end of the day, if you feel like going back on your day and, and say, I was really a little bit weak on peace today, We'll go find out why. Go find out why. Because it's not that God wasn't giving it to you. Go find out why. And I'll tell you what the answer is going to be. Somewhere it's going to be sin. Uh, it, that is, I've used the illustration that God is always communicating to us, always present with us, and we're, we're a believer. But if we have our hand held walkie-talkie on the wrong channel, and we don't hear him, that's, that's the effect of sin. Okay. Ultimately, in 1 Peter 4, it's going to tell us that there is ultimately one reason why spiritual gifts are given, and that's for the glory of God. 
to build up the kingdom of God, to equip each other for the glory of God. Any questions about the definition or, or any other thoughts that you have about the definition? This is, this by the way, is not an inspired piece of paper. <laughs> okay. I think you already said it though. In addition to the glory of God, to build each other up too. I talk to the spiritual gifts to build each other up, and that this is all for the glory of God. One of the what 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 stops us from using our spiritual gifts? We listen to ourselves instead of let the Holy Spirit try mm -hmm. us. Tell me what you mean by that. That's a great answer, but tell me what you mean by that. Well, well we're so with the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, and when we're using it, that utility, um, a lot of it is, is almost like autopilot for us. We have to have our spirit quiet, so to allow the Holy Spirit work through us in doing that. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I, I found that with myself. If I, if I, I, I could be the worst person, because I get in the way of what the Holy Spirit wants to do mm -hmm. within me. And so I have to put myself aside, and that includes ego and pride. Okay, so now let's go with this list. I like where you're going now. Ego. What is it about ego that stops us from using the Holy Spirit? You think you do it in your own power, you can't. Mm -hmm. A couple of ways. One is you choose to do it because I'm so good. Right. And the other is uh, almost like the reverse of ego. I don't want to look, make it look like I'm all that. I know. Right. False humility. Yeah. yeah. False humility. And then, and then there's just fear and doubt. Huh? Fear and doubt. Fear and doubt of doing it wrong or being criticized. Mm. All of all of these things above. And then there's just flat out laziness. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> now I wanted to say that there are gifts that each one of us get. And, and eventually we're going to talk about the unique gifts. How do you know what your gifts are? But I'm going to tell you this is not a complete list, but this is, this is a list of things that we all get when we become believers. Romans 5, Ephesians 1, Romans 8, they all indicate that we get the Holy Spirit at some point in time after we're saved. When, when Stop me, please, somebody. <laughs> We get the Holy Spirit right now. Exactly. Right now. And, and there is not a second baptism of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There, there is, there is... A filling. I'm sorry? A filling. A filling. Now, do we choose not to follow the Holy Spirit? Yes. But what we get is the entirety of the Holy Spirit, and He does a ton of stuff for us. Let's read a few of these passages. Uh, Sandy, you're going to get Romans 8. Galatians 4, uh, Karen, right, okay, Ivan, 1 Corinthians 2, all the way back there, John, Romans 8, uh, and, and we'll just talk to the others, eight, Romans 8, 15. We have, because of the Holy Spirit, we have we have an understanding. We have we have a position that is different than the rest of the world, and that every believer gets. We are adopted heirs. We are we are new, and in fact, we are able through the Holy Spirit to say something. Uh, who's got Galatians four six? Here. Galatians four six. And because ye are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son unto your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Is that right? Yes. Because we are his heirs, we get the Holy Spirit who instructs us, encourages us, and teaches us how to say, Abba, Father. And this is, this is almost countercultural. If, if you read these things in the context of the Jew who had all the Old Testament laws, they couldn't even say the name of God. About all they could do. We know it as Yahweh. They had the, the tetragrammatron, and all it was was the 
consonants they couldn't even, you can't even pronounce it but now we we put but we get to call Abba Father and that is something every believer gets if uh, if you hear the testimony of somebody who's five years old and they've accepted the Lord they get to they get to call Abba Father and if and if a person at their deathbed acknowledges and calls it out they they get to call out Abba Father there is no partial gift of being able to do that. 2 Corinthians 2.14 But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. In God's economy, you are saved or you are not saved. You've got to be born again. You've got to be born again. And if you are, are not born again, you're on this side of the ledger and you're not going to understand things of God. It's as simple as that. If you are on the ledger, you have the Holy Spirit which allows you to understand the things of God. Now, exercising this talent, this gift, allows you to do it more and more and better and better. Uh, we had uh, three young, young guys it, it, it's amazing how you can have these three young guys have the courage to stand up in front of some some old guys like me, some almost old guys, right? And 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 to preach a message to us, Jack and Tim and, Tim and Joe, Jake. not Tim. Joe. Jake. Tim wasn't there. Tim couldn't get off the work. It was Jack, Jacob, and Ian. Ian. Yeah. Yeah. Some of them are in high school. Yeah. Some of them only been believer a number of years, and they and they stand up, and they're able they're able to take a passage and find a truth of that passage, mm. and to preach that passage to us in a way that it, it stirred me. Yeah. Mm. It stirred me. That only comes from the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. If you're given the opportunity to give a devotional or to teach a class. Don't be afraid. It's the Holy Spirit that's going to give you the words in the first place. Charles Spurgeon was a pastor at 17. 17. Was he a preacher? <laughs> he was the people's preacher. Oh my goodness. Dr. Warren has a very strict definition of preaching and according to his very strict definition of preaching you take a passage you find the main point of that passage and then you work that passage into application sub bullets and then you teach out of that passage those sub, uh, so those sub bullets and to him Spurgeonizing is not preaching <laughs> it's teaching <laughs> He had he had Pastor Jeff going around. It was like it was hysterical. I was often like to have heard that. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we we understand the things of God and the world can't. That's why if you go in into First Corinthians five and it talks about sexual immorality within the church and what are we supposed to do with the one who is caught in sexual immorality? Anybody? I'm sorry. Confront. Confront them, even maybe to the point of taking them out for a season that they might be won back. Communicate if necessary. And what does it say at the end of that chapter? Oh, by the way, if there's somebody caught in immorality and they're not a believer, this doesn't apply to them. Treat them like a tax collector or a sinner. Well, you do that, but. They don't expect don't expect your neighbor who doesn't know the scriptures to to accept your ex, you know, exegete of a passage because they they don't they they can't they they can't this is all a gift of God but we have a gift of God and and if if you are truly a believer and, and you have not taken the time because this is a big book to to go into it. Uh, well, one of my favorite theological movies is What About Bob? <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Baby steps. Baby steps, yeah. Baby steps. Everybody can take a baby step. 
And if you are a child of God, you have the Holy Spirit, he will help you understand what is to be said here if you take the time, if you take the time to listen. Romans 8 tells us that he even teaches us how to pray. At those, those moments of darkness where perhaps sin has come into your life and despair has overtaken you, you still have the Holy Spirit who's going to teach you how to pray. And in fact, if you can't even figure it out, he's going to intercede for you. Every believer has this. And then in Galatians 5, 16, walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Say that a little louder. And you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's right. This is the Holy Spirit. We all have desires of the flesh. It doesn't say that when you're a believer, those desires go away. It says if you walk in the Spirit, you're not going to fulfill those desires of the flesh that are already within you. This is the gift of the Holy Spirit. It then says in Galatians 5.22 that I'm not telling you what not to do without giving you what you ought to have, and those are the fruit of the Spirit. And you listen, I am against such there is no law. And they that walk in the Spirit will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. This is, this is all equipping... And in fact, then it tells us when we get into an, an arena where we're maybe talking to somebody we don't know and there's this urging that we, we ought to say something, it says that he's going to equip us with the power to proclaim the Spirit. Here, here's the followers that are up on the mountaintop and Matthew 28 tells us that he goes and he says, make, make disciples of all the world. Uh, but in Acts 1, it says, And the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and in the uttermost parts of the world. Mm -hmm. That's what we get as believers. It's not only some of us, we all, we all get that power. Dr. Warren was leaving his hotel room Tuesday morning to come, to come here. And he shared with us an experience that just brightened up his entire day. Do you remember what it was? Yes, uh, a woman came into the elevator and started to witness to him. Oh, oh did she? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Saying, do you know Jesus? And he was taken aback and it was like, wow. Cool. So great. Yeah. What a way to start a day. Yeah. <gasps> yeah. Man, that, that, for somebody like Dr. Warren, that's got to be encouraging to have somebody with the boldness to say, do you know Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, especially from New Jersey. <laughs> Maybe she was out of town. I was going to say, she was in a hotel. She wasn't in New Jersey. <laughs> and oh, by the way, Luke 12, 12 tells us that he's even going to give us the words. I didn't hear that. He's even going to give us the words. I know that from many experiences. There are times that I know I've said something as like, where did that come from? <laughs> yes. We get the Holy Spirit. I've given you a sheet. The next passage is talking about the gifts that we classically call the gifts. And there are, there are four passages which we could read. Uh, maybe we ought to, because this is a class on spiritual gifts. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> Rich, if you get Ephesians 4.11, uh, we'll do that one first. Read that. Now, you can follow along on this because I've given you what the different gifts are. And some of them are position gifts, and some of them are ability gifts. Some of them are sign gifts. There's different gifts. But the verse that they show up in the passage is on, is on this little thing here. Give me, give me 4.11. 4.11. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. Okay, this, in, in Ephesians, it's a list of position gifts, is, is what it is. They're reiterated somewhat in, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. Uh, position gifts are there. What is a position gift? In what position is in the church? It's an office. It's like an office. Title. Office. Yeah, title is, we got to be careful with that because title can be, uh, anyway, it's more of a position, it, it's what you are. So he lists apostles. Well, the, one of the questions can be, are there apostles today? 
No. That comes down to the question of sensation versus continuation. The Nord groups think there are. I'm sorry? The Nord groups. New Apostolic Reformation. Okay, New Apostolic Reformation. There are those who do do uh, take the fact that apostles exist today. We don't. We, we don't. And why would we not think apostles are today? Because, well, the original apostles saw Jesus. And they witnessed his, his resurrection. Well, they knew him after he rose. And I believe that's the answer, is the definition, having seen been taught by Jesus. Paul fits that in a supernatural way. Yeah. So when he claims that Paul, an apostle of Christ, he's, he, he legitimately is. He was born out of time. Born out of time, but, but he, he, he had quite an experience meeting him. Today that's not happening. We, we don't believe that apostles are in position today. But we do have, we do have prophets evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What are the difference between a prophet, an evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher? Well, a prophet can either foretell or foretell. Tell the difference between them for... Well, uh, the foretell is to tell the future. The foretell is just to tell the word. Okay. It's questionable whether the foretelling exists today mm -hmm. or not. And that's a debate. <clears throat> but forth telling, proclaiming the reality and the truth of what is happening, that's, that's a prophet, but because we do have prophets, I mean Isaiah did a lot of forth telling as well as foretelling, you know Habakkuk uh, did a little so many of the Old Testament prophets were forth telling but there was also a foretelling you know, element to it um, we don't really subscribe to foretelling at this time, but we do have subscribed to forth telling. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's the difference between an evangelist and a pastor? They use John. They use the Gospel of John. The <laughs> well, pastor is a shepherd. A shepherd. Pastor shepherds the flock. Mm -hmm. And there's many ways to do that, but that's what a pastor does. I, I would agree with you there. The pastor, uh, and, and in fact, Pastor and elder are scripturally basically the same thing. Uh, and, and, and Pastor Jeff is very, uh, very quick to call himself an elder as opposed to a pastor. Uh, this is me speaking now and I'm not inspired. Uh, <laughs> the individual who has the responsibility to spiritually lead the church is called to that position. I believe by God as a pastor. I believe by the congregation listening to the Holy Spirit, calling and putting him in that position. Um, I, I may be a pastor, but I am not the pastor. Pastor Jeff is the pastor. You know, some theologians say pastor teacher is one gift, not two separate gifts. Pastor teacher, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk to that in a second. Uh, typically, the pastor... <coughs> is the one who spiritually is accountable to God for what's going on spiritually within the church. How does that person execute that duty? By preaching and by teaching and, and by leading, all right? Notice I use preaching and teaching separately because I was really convinced over the last two days. But the pastor is that individual in that office called by God to spiritually lead the church. My role as an associate pastor is to be his help, as are the elders in this church. Their role is to be the help and, and accountable to God, you know, for their, how they carry out their spiritual duties. And so when you go into 1 Peter 4, it tells you about the, the elders, and, and you're told to, not to, to encourage them, not to make life difficult for them, uh, because there, there is an accountability. It's not always the good thing, the popular thing but it's the right thing that should be, should be chosen by the pastor. An evangelist specifically is somebody who is gifted to reach the lost with the light of the world, with the light of God. That is an evangelist. Not every senior pastor necessarily is a gift, has the gift of evangelism. There are different gifts. But the church will be equipped with the gift of evangelism. And that pastor should know how to delegate and to use and to encourage 
you know, the evangelist you know, within. It might be an elder or it might be a, a teacher. It, women are evangelists, men are evan evangelists. By the way, I don't know I see a spiritual exhortation against a woman evangelizing a man. Spiritually teaching a man, there, there are exhortations against that. But proclaiming truth to the world, this woman who came up to Tim Warren and said, do you know Jesus Christ? She was being an evangelist, and that's a, that is scriptural, what she was doing. That's scriptural, what she was doing. And then the teacher. Now, pastor, teacher. Pastors can be teachers, pastors can be preachers, and they are two different disciplines. Teaching will, teaching will take you into the scripture. It will exegete. And, I, and there's, there's a, a term that I'm going to use. Make sure everybody understands it. There, there are two different terms, of, two different approaches of going to scripture. You exegete or you eisegete. Okay, eis put on to. Ex take out of. Somebody who has a, um, a concept, a, a belief, that they want to encourage other people into accepting will take that thought. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to pick on anybody. I, hopefully I don't pick on anybody on this one. But if somebody totally believes in soul sleep and they go into passages until they can prove soul sleep, that's eisegeting. Mm -hmm. Soul sleep says, I die, I'm asleep until Christ returns. Oh, okay. Okay. The opposite of soul sleep is today I'm in the presence of God. Jesus said on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. He didn't say when you wake up you will be with me in paradise. Or to be absent from the body is present to be present with the Lord. There you go, to be absent with the body. But there are those who will take scriptures, because there are scriptures that make it sound like you you're, know, asleep. you're sleeping. You're sleeping. And Quite frankly, I really don't care because the next thing I'll know is I'm with God anyway. Right. So I don't take a dogmatic stance and our, and our dog denomination doesn't take a dogmatic stance. But taking a thought in your mind and finding the scriptures and quite frankly, often when you're doing that, you're cherry picking a scripture out of context to prove your point. So eisegesis, bad. Don't do that. Exegesis, go to the scripture and, and read a passage and, and find out what is the thought that, that God wants me to get out of this passage. Now, teaching will take a passage and come up with the, the themes that are in that passage and letting Scripture be the best concordance for Scripture. So if, 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 if I'm reading um, and, it's, and it's talking about um, somebody having an action they want to do, and I see that it's done elsewhere, or it's explained elsewhere. That, that's teaching, is going and using the other passage. In fact, according to Dr. Warren, if I go into, now Matthew's got the Sermon on the Mount, and Luke, I think it is, has a, an abbreviated version of the Sermon on the Mount. And to take the Luke passage of the Sermon on the Mount and to preach it, by taking the other thoughts that are in Matthew is not preaching, it's teaching. Isn't, isn't Luke's good enough? Is what he would say. <laughs> Did God not give you enough in Luke? <laughs> so preaching takes the passage. What does that passage teach you? Because each author of a gospel has a different purpose for his gospel. And so he would say, take the passage, teach, learn the passage, preach the passage, that is a self, that's an amazing grace. <laughs> Preaching will take a message. Now, I, I, I will confess that I was taught this back when I was in seminary and I've forgotten it. So when I've stood up in front and preached, I've used other passages. And I don't know if I'm going to stop doing that. I honestly don't know if I will, uh, but I'm going to be more careful about it in the future. If, 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 I, if I find something else in another section and it doesn't really enforce what this author is trying to say, that's not preaching, that's teaching. Finding, finding the full. Now, he went on Sunday and he started out, what was, what was his one thing on Sunday? Anybody remember? Secretariat. He yeah. talked a story. Okay, now that was an illustration. What was his one thing? Finish, finish well. well. Finish well. Yeah. Absolutely. And so he ended up going 
to, uh, to Joshua. Because mm -hmm. he said, I'm, I'm in Hebrews 12, and, and there's a therefore, and I can look back. Therefore, we have such a great cloud of witnesses. Well, who are those witnesses? It's legitimate to go back to Hebrews 11. Who are those witnesses? And quite frankly, Hebrews 11 doesn't tell you about, a lot about why Rahab's on that list. And in fact, it doesn't even tell you a whole lot about why Joshua's on that list. So it's okay to go back into uh, into uh, Exodus and, and even into Joshua to find out what made him a man of faith. And, and so he defended the use of that as opposed to trying to expand on the, the, the satisfactory content of what was there. But he still, his message was finished well. He uses the illustration of Secretariat, mm -hmm. of Derek Redmond, mm -hmm. and he used one other, he used one in the middle somewhere. I can't remember what it was. But the point is that when you teach, if you use an illustration carefully, don't make the illustration the point so that somebody walks out and says, oh man, that story about Secretariat was great. <laughs> <laughs> I need to finish well. Mm -hmm. I need to finish well. The hook of the illustration should drive into it. That's preaching. Uh, there's a lot more latitude on teaching. We did not finish today. It's almost quarter up. This went by really? very, very fast. Oh, yeah. uh, I will, I will say this, that uh, God uniquely gifts people positionally. He uniquely calls somebody to be a pastor. He uniquely calls somebody to be an evangelist. That doesn't mean that the rest of us should not do evangelism. Mm -hmm. there, are, uh, there are applications of the gifts that other people get besides the one that's the gift that evangelist. And so we're going to try to get into that next week, and then we'll talk about cessation, continuation, uh, the tongues. Mm -hmm. And then how do you know what, what is your gift? But it's, it's quarter up, so we probably should let this go. So Jeff will get one more week to, to prepare Isaiah 53. All right. Rick, could you close us in a prayer? Dear Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you, we worship you, we glorify you, and we praise you, Lord God. We pray the same for our children and grandchildren, Lord God, and our friends and our neighbors. Lord God, we thank you for Pastor John and for studying the spiritual gifts which we know we all have for your glory and honor and for the building of the body. Lord God, you told us that the gifts and calls are irrevocable, Lord God, that even though we may not use them now, we know that you have a pet plan and a place and a time for us to use them for your glory, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for this time. We thank you for John. And we pray that we grow in our love for each other, Lord God. For like Pastor John said, we may have all the gifts, but there's nothing but a noisy gun and a climbing yes. symbol if we don't even have love. Yes. Lord God, and we pray to help us grow in our love for you and for each other. And Father, give us journey mercies as we travel home. We thank you for your divine hand of love and protection. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks.